Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Congressional Western Caucus Permitting Month Forum. Today, we're joined by my friend and colleague from the great state of North Dakota, Mr. Kelly Armstrong. <clears throat> Throughout the month of March, the Congressional Western Caucus members are highlighting examples of broken permitting processes that, that impede our ability in rural America to make progress on infrastructure projects, on energy development, on conservation, land management, and many more things. It should be no surprise that permitting processes have grown outdated and out of control. What should be a simple environmental review, a process that can add years, if not decades, and millions of dollars in cost to projects across the country. So with so much focus and billions and billions of dollars from Congress directed towards improving our nation's crumbling infrastructure, we just have to find ways to streamline and to modernize and improve our permitting processes. We've got to cut through that old bureaucratic red tape and reduce regulatory, regulatory burdens on, on rural America. A few weeks ago, Congressman Armstrong brought to our attention a highway in North Dakota while speaking at one of our Western Caucus member meetings. And I'm looking, to, looking forward to hearing more about this highway today and how it's permitting challenges at nearly every level of government between federal, state, county, and even tribal levels uh, provide a demonstration of just how broken our processes are. And this is not limited to just North Dakota, let me tell you. This example though is unique to North Dakota, but I really think it illustrates just how bogged down projects like this can get all because of duplicative burdensome permitting. So today we're gonna to spend some time highlighting the different permitting challenges in North Dakota, impacting their farmers, energy producers, businesses, and landowners. So those, all those challenges that they all face. We're joined by a few very special guests today. I'm happy to introduce, but before we do that, I'd like to yield to my friend, a fantastic advocate for the state of North Dakota, Congressman Armstrong, to Give us a few opening remarks, sir. I, I appreciate, appreciate it, Dan. And I appreciate the letter you just sent regarding waters of the US and everybody in North Dakota will really appreciate that. It's a fight that we have um, been out front of many, many years. And I'm super excited because I get to do this with three of my very good friends. So uh, I don't want to steal your thunder or any of that, but uh, Jessica Bell is, uh, the chair of the Senate Finance and Tax Committee. Lynn Helms is the uh, chair of North Dakota, or Julie Podorchak is the chair of the uh, Public Service Commission. And Lynn Helms has been the director of Department of Mineral Resources for a long time. And they've all three of them have dealt with permitting either from the legislative level, the state level, and unfortunately too often for the federal level. Uh, so I'm excited to hear about them. I know we only have a half hour. I just wanna give them a little background as to how we started this. And I, I did it originally in a hearing, and then I did it at a Western Conference meeting, and I was talking about Highway 85 as it goes over the Missouri River, and whether you want to put uh, the highway across the river, a pipeline across the river, transmission line across the river, but it's a bottleneck in North Dakota, and if you're trying to move anything from the Fort Berthold Reservation down on that side, and I just listed all the potential agencies you had to deal with, starting with BIA, Interior, Forest Service, EPA, Corps of Engineers, FERC, DOT, State DOT, Tribal Government, PEC, PSC, Department of Environmental Quality, County and Zoning, and Game and Fish. And this has come up a lot in a lot of our hearings in DC on the Energy and Commerce Committee. And I always point out to people with this type of infrastructure, you don't have to stop it everywhere. You just have to stop it in one spot. And it doesn't matter if it's six miles away from where you live or 30 miles away from where you live. Lynn and Jessica both know this very well in that in the certain areas in Western North Dakota, if you have 99 landowners out of hundred that agree to a pipeline, you don't have a pipeline. Uh, there just, there's geography and topographic places where that goes. And that, unfortunately for us in a lot of situations, those are just North Dakota permitting, but We've now got a 3-2 decision from FERC that came out on February 19th, which is causing serious consternation for getting infrastructure put in the ground across the country uh, about mitigating upstream and downstream carbon. And I can't think of three better people 
to talk about how this negatively affects North Dakota in certain ways and also the positive things we do to get infrastructure on the ground. So I will uh, be quiet and let the experts speak. Well, I appreciate that very much, Kelly. And, and thank you for taking time to help put this forum together today. I think it's gonna be a great conversation and thanks for introducing our guests. So, so let's, let's get started. Um, um, so first we have Lynn Helms. He's the director of the North Dakota Department of Mineral Resources. Uh, Mr. Helms, welcome very, uh, to you to be with us today. Thanks for, uh, for doing that. And I'll let you kick off with a few remarks about, about your position and perhaps some of the permitting challenges that in, in your uh, perspective, what you've witnessed in the great state of North Dakota. Well, thank you, Chairman Newhouse and uh, Representative Armstrong. Thanks for having me. And uh, I'll make this brief, but uh, we primarily intersect with the federal permitting challenges in the oil and gas field. And of course, um, that's been incredibly contentious uh, over the last year and a half. When you look back uh, and, and you talked about multiple roadblocks and multiple pathways that things have to go through. So, uh, of, of late, we've spent uh, more than a year, and it looks like we're going to spend another six months without a federal lease sale in the state of North Dakota. And before you can get a drilling permit, you have to have a lease uh, from the Department of Interior. Uh, we spent six years working through a resource management plan program with the Corps of Engineers and the Forest Service to finally get to records of decision in June and December of 2020 that would allow leasing to go forward. Um, we, we virtually had no leases issued during that time period. Once that happened, uh, the Biden administration suspended lease sales. And now as a result of lawsuits by the Wild Earth Guardians, they've continued to withhold those lease sales in the first and second quarter of this year. We have over a thousand wells that could be drilled if they would move forward on the 240 some tracks that have been nominated and cleared by the, those resource management plans. You have to ask why after the Corps of Engineers and the Forest Service went through all of that NEPA process uh, that the Department of Interior then decides to do its own environmental assessment and allow a protest period and then suspend those sales because of litigation by a group called Wild Earth Guardians, which isn't about the North Dakota leases at all. It's about Wyoming and Montana leases. Uh, and yet we, we all got drug into it. And so it, it's not just the fact of repetitive over and over NEPA analysis and permitting processes, but then at any one of those junctures, uh, someone can step in and litigate and, and stop the process again. And as Congressman Armstrong said, uh, it only has to be stopped at one of those junctions to stop it completely. So here we sit with uh, over a thousand wells that uh, operators absolutely wanna drill and produce the oil and gas from. We've seen the permitting process uh, for permits uh, expand by over a hundred percent fiscal year 21 versus fiscal year 19. Uh, and so it's just at every junction, we, we've seen the permitting process get bogged down by litigation and repeated, repeated, repeated NEPA analysis. Thank you very much for, for hearing what I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Helms. I appreciate those remarks. And uh, wow, uh, you're absolutely right. So many different things that uh, stand in the way of our development of our rural areas and our communities. Uh, next, we have very happy to uh, have with us a state senator, senator from the great state of North Dakota, um, Jessica Bell. And so, Senator Bell, thank you for being with us. I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, regulations are one of my favorite things to talk about because uh, there's so much material there. Uh, so I've been serving in the legislature for a decade now. Um, and I started in 2013. And during that time period, we dealt with a lot of the challenges in the energy committee uh, that we were facing as we expanded the development of the Bakken oil field. Uh, so we've got a lot of experience in, at the state level where I think a lot of, um, uh, where is the best place for us to be regulating our industry, both there and at the local level. 
Um, Lynn talked a lot about what happens when the feds get involved and it usually does just overcomplicate things. And we, we see that in committee. I also am an environmental manager for NACO Natural Resources, a company that owns and operates three coal mines here in North Dakota and a couple of other mining operations across the United States. One of the things that I do in my day job, we've got a true citizen legislature here in North Dakota, is I deal with federal permitting and federal leasing um, for coal tracks. And we've faced moratoriums in the past um, and other hurdles. But throughout that NEPA process, uh, which under the Biden administration, we're actually allowed to be able to continue any leases that we had applied for previously and to continue the process to try and obtain those leases. The problem that we have is the process is extremely slow. Washington bureaucrats ensure that at every step we face hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. And so uh, one of the, the biggest black holes that our applications will fall in is the solicitor's office in DOI out in DC. A document will go there and um, we might not see it again for a very long time and lose control over everything that's been included in our NEPA analysis. Uh, even just this morning, the courts reversed a decision that they had previously made on the social cost of carbon. It was, we were told it couldn't be included in our lease applications, and now today we're being told it has to be included in our lease application. And so it's this ping pong of applications once they get in the queue uh, that takes anywhere um, at a minimum of, of five years to get through the process. So. Um, I'm an advocate for local and state control of regulations. We're the people who live here, so we're the ones who know how to do it best. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you um, and we'll continue our discussion. Well, thank you very much, Senator Bell. I appreciate you being with us today. Um, next, we have the chair of the North Dakota Public Service Commission, uh, Ms. Julie Federchak. So, Julie, could you share with us some of the, your thoughts on this subject? I think you're not unmuted yet, Julie. There Sorry. You go. There you go. All right. Thank you, Chair Newhouse. I appreciate the invitation to be here today. Um, just a tiny bit of background on the North Dakota Public Service Commission. We regulate the investor-owned utilities in our state. Um, we engage on a regular basis with both the regional transmission organizations that serve our state, that includes MISO and SPP. Um, we also are a permitting agency. We permit energy infrastructure, including hazardous liquid transmission pipelines like crude oil, natural gas, and uh, CO2 lines, as well as electric transmission lines and energy generation, including wind farms, solar farms, and natural gas facilities. And then we also oversee our state's um, coal mining and reclamation. So we have our hands in a lot of the different sectors and in our state's energy industry, both the fossil fuel and the renewable sectors. And we have a lot of both in North Dakota. Um, I was most recently president of the organization of MISO states. So I've seen, uh, I've had a front row seat in a lot of the issues um, uh, of the energy trans transformation that is occurring in our country. And there is a major energy transformation occurring in our energy industries across the United States. And many people are really excited about that. Um, some of them are excited because of the environmental benefits. Uh, some of them are excited because they love solving problems and others are excited because they're making a lot of money. And then some fall into all three categories of those. Um, but no matter how where you sit on this transformation, it is going to occur. There is no denying that. And what I believe is that leaders at all levels, and I would emphasize especially leaders at the congressional le le uh, level, uh, need to be focusing on is that during this transition, we focus our priority on reliability and affordability. Those two things need to drive this transformation. They need to be priorities number one and priorities number two. And I would really say that federal permitting threatens that. Um, slow walking the federal coal permits, which Jessica Bell just kind of talked about, or prohibitions on oil leasing, which Lynn Helms has um, been frustrated with, and our whole in, uh, oil industry has been uh, struggling with. Uh, those are serious issues that also impact this energy transformation. 
Um, in my area, the policy that um, Congressman Armstrong just talked about, FERC's new interim policy statement on greenhouse gas, um, that's a real problem. And it, it attempts to create certainty by creating a new scenario for regulating greenhouse gas emissions, both upstream and downstream, um, on a case-by-case -case basis. And so you can't create certainty on a case-by-case -case basis. That's just like counter, you know, they, those two goals run against each other. And, and furthermore, in that particular uh, rule, it's really challenging for the per pipeline um, companies to attempt to quantify greenhouse gas emissions by end use customers of which they have no control and of which FERC has no control or jurisdiction over. And so that kind of policy is going to have a few different impacts. It'll delay development, which is going to delay this transformation. It's gonna limit supply of natural gas in particular, and it's gonna drive up costs. All of those things threaten the reliability and the affordability that need to be kept front and center to have a safe transformation that also um, protects our economy and our way of life and the safety of the citizens of this country. Natural gas is absolutely essential to the reliability and affordability during this transition. There's no way to do it without strong natural gas supplies. And we have to have more pipeline infrastructure in this country delivered to support the generation, to support the reliability that is needed to successfully integrate these new renewable fuels into the market. So uh, be it natural gas or uh, carbon capture storage um, used on, on top of the uh, coal fire generation, those are all the solutions that we have to provide a pathway through, through the federal uh, policies to ensure that these types of fuels and these types of um, on-demand generation resources are available to keep our system safe, strong, and affordable. So I'd be happy to talk about more specifics, but those are some of the big things on my mind as it relates to this transformation and the federal permitting that's gonna make it possible. Oh, thank you very much, Julie. Appreciate that. I hope I didn't butcher your last name too bad. <laughs> you got it. It's good. Thanks. And thank all of you. You, you all make great points, uh, very important points. Um, you know, the challenges, like I said before, that I think you're facing in North Dakota, um, even though you've got some unique situations. Um, but I think a lot of those challenges are reflected throughout rural communities all over the country. And so that's why it's. I, I think it's important to hear from you and what you're seeing and how you're dealing with them. So I appreciate all of your comments. So let, let's, um, let me ask a few questions if I could. I'm gonna start with uh, Congressman Armstrong. Um, so Kelly, and you, you brought this subject up, so that's why I'm thinking about it, but uh, the waters of the United States, which uh, I guess, what, what can we say about that? You know, the, the ambiguity surrounding its definition truly has uh, plagued rural America for decades. I, I believe it's, it could be termed the biggest over regulatory overreach that our country's ever seen. Uh, could, you, could you talk about some of the challenges that from your, pers your perspective you've, you've seen in North Dakota regarding water permitting and, and issues related to WOTUS? Absolutely, I, and I'll start with, if you look at a map under the most, uh, <laughs> what I would say is realistic view the federal government will take of waters of the United States, 90% of North Dakota will fall under the under waters of the United States. And I don't think anybody other than true ideologues would believe that a stock dam 300 miles from a federally navigated waterway should be part of federal, federal control and federal regulation. And when you're talking about everything that these three just talked about, I also want to talk about the positive side of this, why we're so frustrated, why we're so terrified, why our former attorney general was the tip of the spear on the injunctions related to uh, WOTUS, because you have two regulators, and at the time I was a state senator, and at the time Senator Bell was uh, the chair of the National Resource Committee in North Dakota in the middle of an oil bloom. We were putting pipe in the ground, rewriting policies, like on the fly in 2013 and 2015, it's really hard for people who work here 
to recognize the speed and just the capacity for growth that we had. And we had two regulators. We didn't always agree, but we got in rooms, we worked this out, and we got this stuff and it done in a reasonable dynamic fashion that protected the environment, protected the rate pair, and also allowed for us to expand at a level we would have just simply never been able to do if the federal government was involved in that process. We'd still be waiting on permits. And when you're talking about waters of the United States and the two biggest industries from North Dakota, which are agriculture and energy, we cannot have the federal government having privacy on 90% of the geographic area of North Dakota. I, Dan, I can't overemphasize this enough. It would, it would destroy our state. <laughs> that is just the truth. Yeah, no, I, that, that's why we, we want people to understand the significance of this issue, because you're absolutely right. And this is, we see it played out in every, every single state in the country. So, so thanks, for, thanks for painting that picture. As, as uh, dismal as it is, people need to understand that. Um, so let me, let me turn to uh, Mr. Holmes and Ms. Fedorchak. Uh, um, we know North Dakota is a state that is rich in natural resources. Uh, many of the, well, let me just call them uh, extreme environmental groups, I would just as soon see those resources kept in the ground versus being developed for the benefit of, of your state, uh, communities uh, and states across the country. Um, so Mr. Helms first, and, and then uh, maybe Ms. Fedorchak, you could chime in as well. <clears throat> Can you talk about the difficulties uh, the Department of Mineral Resources has faced as well as the uh, Public Service Commission? when legal challenges are brought from these groups and, and uh, tell us how it impacts the work that you do and what you're responsible for. Thank you, Chairman Newhouse. Um, I kind of alluded to it in my opening comments, but uh, we're in the middle of this pitched battle over oil and gas leasing in the Montana Dakotas. And uh, like I said, we've got over a thousand wells that are being held up by the lack of leasing and permitting on federal lands in North Dakota. That seems like an extreme amount, but what you have to understand is the way land ownership is situated in North Dakota, a tract as small as five acres can hold up the drilling of a horizontal well and suspend the, the production of minerals on state and private owned minerals uh, that are 92% of the mineral estate. So uh, this leasing program, uh, has become a ping pong ball tossed back and forth by Department of Interior as a result of challenges by groups like Wild Earth Guardians uh, to the NEPA process, uh, which was fully uh, vetted by the U.S. Forest Service and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, but now they're challenging it when it reaches the, uh, the gate at the Department of Interior, and it has held up the leasing of these minerals for 18 months now, and it looks like there's no end in sight. Another example is uh, our challenge to the venting and flaring rules, the waste rules uh, that came out under the Obama administration. Uh, we won that lawsuit in federal court in Wyoming. Uh, groups then challenged that same rule in a California court and won on their side. So there are two competing federal court rulings uh, as a result. Uh, they've never been consolidated. They've never been settled. And uh, the litigation just continues to drag on. Uh, we're now six years into that and no end in sight. So the, the ability to challenge these things in multiple court venues and to file multiple challenges over the years uh, can drag out in, into decades uh, of delay when our nation needs this industry, uh, needs this energy today. Julie, anything you'd like to add? Sure, I would just um, highlight two, two sort of prominent cases that have impacted us. Our permits themselves have not been challenged by these groups, but the work that we've done and its connection to other agencies. So uh, on Dakota Access, pipeline, uh, the Public Service Commission in North Dakota permitted that 300 mile route through North Dakota. It was contingent on the Corps of Engineers permit across the river, and that's still being um, held up in court. Now that pipeline is operational, and, um, and 
but the state and our agency has been deeply involved in several of the challenges to that permit that are continuing to work their way through the courts and um, threaten the expansion of that pipeline and just threaten its continued operation, which has had significant positive benefits, not only to the citizens of, the, of North Dakota, but the entire country. Um, when, when prior to Dakota access, there was an awful lot of crude oil being um, transported by rail and people were not happy about that all the way from here to the West Coast um, and, uh, and, and the East Coast too. Um, because of Dakota Access, we've taken a vast majority of that crude oil into the pipeline. It, it's transported silently across the country uh, to the markets and the places where people need it. So and that's one that's got a lot of attention. And then second one is the, the Enbridge Sandpiper line. It was a line that we permitted in the North Dakota um, Public Service Commission probably back in 2013 or 2014, and it was to take crude oil from the Bakken all the way to Duluth in um, Minnesota and into other markets beyond that. We permitted it through North Dakota. It never was permitted in Minnesota because of all the legal battles and fighting on, on that permitting process. They never were able to and finally just gave up on the project and, and um, shuttered it. And so, um, and then the replacement line in Minnesota is still kind of, um, working itself through the process, the regulatory process. So, you know, on these crude oil pipelines, the permitting challenges um, have, have just been endless and uh, they add a lot of cost, they add a lot of delay, and they, they certainly provide a chilling effect on any future big pipeline development for future developers. Yeah, thank you very much for that, appreciate it. Uh, let me turn to our Senator, um, Senator Bell. Um, as a state legislator, and I understand a business leader, um, you have some experience and perspective that maybe will help us to round out our permit permitting lens here today. Could you talk a little bit about the importance of an efficient permitting system from a business perspective and how we can achieve that while still keeping rules and regulations in place to address the needs of the of environmental stewardship uh, from, from a legislative perspective. You know, we wanna have a good balance here. Any thoughts there, Senator Bell? Um, yes, thank you, Chairman Newhouse. And I think the groundwork that we've laid in the uh, North Dakota legislature and uh, regulatory regime over the past decade uh, for carbon capture utilization and storage is probably the best example to give um, to talk about regulatory certainty and how that affects investments that businesses are able to make. Um, Mr. Helms has done a fabulous job of ensuring that we have every last piece of regulatory um, processes in place so that we can utilize our geologic jackpot that we have here in North Dakota um, to store permanently carbon dioxide and also be able to potentially use it for enhanced oil recovery in the oil field. We of course need to continue to develop the technology for our coal-fired power plants. We've got quite a few of them here in North Dakota to capture that um, carbon dioxide and then utilize the um, structure that we've, the regulatory structure that we've got in place. Um, we've done a great job here. We've taken all of the, um, the primacy that we can from the feds so that we can operate here at the state level and do as much permitting locally here as we can. But the problem that we've run into is um, when other programs such as regional haze impact the ability of companies to move forward with projects like CCUS. Uh, regional haze, of course, is based on visibility um, improvements over a period of time, and we're just entering into round two um, state, uh, a state plan, state implementation plan here in North Dakota. Uh, we anticipate that that plan will not require investments on any of our coal-fired facilities because uh, there are no improvements that they can make on the ground that would actually improve visibility here in North Dakota. Um, but we will be sending that state implementation plan up to EPA for approval. And um, I won't try and guess what it is that the Biden administration's EPA is going to do, but I do anticipate that there will be court challenges related to that. 
Now, as that plays out in the court system and drags on over a period of time, it makes it incredibly difficult for investors to make investments in CCUS technology on our facilities because they cannot anticipate what the federal government is going to tell them they need to do on a different semi-related program. So um, that certainty uh, and that cooperation between the federal government and the state government uh, boils down to companies making big investments in our communities and our state and our environment as we look to the future, because we know we need to invest in carbon capture and we want to, and we're headed that direction. Um, but continued um, different messages coming from the federal government make that really, really difficult for our private business community. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so we're, we're drawing near to the close of our forum for today. Um, I want to give each of you an opportunity maybe to leave some lasting thoughts with our, with our audience, if you have anything that more you'd like to share. So uh, can we start with you, uh, Mr. Armstrong, uh, Con Congressman Armstrong? Absolutely. Uh, I think one of the reasons I get so frustrated out here is because I know that there are really smart people in North Dakota. You are talking to three of whoever is watching this right now. You've had the luxury of having three of the experts that have absolutely lived this in some of the highest intensity growth that any state has ever seen in this industry. But you know what else? We all live there. We all raise children there. We love the outdoors. If you don't love the outdoors, living in North Dakota is not really exactly where it is. It's not an industrial waste site. We protect our air, we protect our water, and they'll all be too nice to say it, but their answer really is if you keep the federal government the hell out of the way, everything would work a lot better. So I'm so excited to have these three and just thank you all for taking time out of your day to do it. Great. Great, Kelly. Thanks for those thoughts. That's what people need to hear. And it's working well in North Dakota, uh, and we appreciate them sharing. Lynn Helms, director of the North Dakota Department of Mineral Resources. Any, any parting thoughts you'd like to impart? Well, Chairman Newhouse, uh, thanks for the time. Uh, and I know that there's a huge amount of work ahead of you guys, but I would strongly urge the Congress uh, at the next opportunity uh, to engage in NEPA reform and reform of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, those two laws uh, are 50 years old and they're in desperate need of being updated uh, because the federal bureaucrats uh, and the uh, radical environmental organizations have figured out how to abuse them and interfere with every single infrastructure energy project that's brought forth in the country. I appreciate that. They're being weaponized and contrary uh, to the in original intended purpose. So no, thank, that's a great point. So chair of the North Dakota Public Service Commission, Julie Vodorchak. Thank you, Chair Newhouse. I would just say that North Dakota has a, a lot of solutions to offer to our country's energy problems. And so um, please give us a chance to help solve those solutions or solve those problems. We have great solutions. We're working on it from every single angle. And the answer is not going to be um, more federal oversight, more federal responsibility through FERC or permitting through these federal agencies. If you want it done quickly and thoroughly and responsibly, let the states do it. We're accountable and close to the people and they'll let us know when we've done it wrong. So please uh, give us more authority, not less. Thank you. Great point, great point. Thank you, Julie. Thanks for being with us. Senator Jessica Bell, any thoughts that you'd like to leave with our listeners? Uh, well, I think the three previous comments, I, I have to agree wholeheartedly with them. I'm a ranch kid from Western North Dakota. I grew up here. I want my parents and my family to continue with our fifth generation ranching operation um, and to keep our air and water clean. I want it more than anybody else possibly could. And so we... Um, when we are developing things here, um, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is I flew out of DC last week and I looked down at all of the population center and the development there. I thought, you know, we don't have curb and gutter where I'm at, um, but that's all I could see across the landscape uh, on the Eastern uh, shore as we were flying out. And I was just so proud of the work that we do in North Dakota because we do 
uh, we do do it right. And I think as we um, as we look specifically uh, shift focus just a little bit to energy markets, making sure, like Commissioner Fedorchek mentioned earlier, that we've got a level playing field for our electricity markets specifically, and we are rewarding that reliability and affordability piece is just going to be critical for our nation as we move forward. Energy independence is done best here on the ground, um, specifically in the Midwest. We know what we're doing, um, and we want to be able to continue to do that. Perfect final word. So I appreciate that. Um, and thank you all. Thank you for being with us uh, on our um, Congressional Western Caucus Permitting Month Forum. You guys have really brought a lot of good ideas to the table, and I'm very proud to, to hear them as chairman of the, of the Western Caucus and, and help elevate your voices to people throughout the country and in, here in Washington, D.C. So appreciate very much your participation. And, and uh, uh, North Dakota is an awesome place. You've got a lot of great things there. And I would agree with Congressman Armstrong, some very, very bright people doing some great things. So thank you for being with us. Uh, that's, uh, that's it uh, from the Congressional Western Caucus on our Permitting Month Forum. Thank you all for watching and we will talk very soon. <laughs>